Welcome everybody to the Locarno 2020 edition. Uh, this, master's class, this master class has been set up by the Locarno Academy team and more specifically the Industry Academy team. Uh, I'm Marion Klotz. I'm the project manager of the Locarno Industry Academy, which is a training program for young professionals of the film industry, initiated by Locarno Festival in 2014 and now developed in seven countries in Europe, Middle East, Latin America and the US. So it's an honor to receive uh, today our two guests. Uh, I begin with Juliana Rojas, uh, your Brazilian director of numerous short films and three feature film release in the most prestigious festival in the world, Cannes or Locarno, where uh, Good Manners, your last film uh, received in 2017, 17, sorry, the Special Jury Award. Uh, you are part this year of the film After Tomorrow selection with Sidaji Campo, your first feature, first feature. You're about to shoot uh, when the pandemic hits Brazil and forced you to stop. Welcome to you also, Sarah, Sarah Silveira, uh, who is a Juliana producer, your founder and producer at Desenove Some Imagens. Correct uh, my pronunciation if you want, Sarah. Yes, you produced. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you produced more than 40 films since uh, 1991, a lot of them in co-production, international co-production, and you're yeah. mostly focused on new talents and, um, and debut uh, directors. I would also like to welcome um, our uh, academy graduates uh, who will be part uh, of this uh, masterclass of this conversation. Maybe uh, you can introduce yourselves, guys. You're all working in a cinema distribution chain. Uh, let's begin with you, Jordan. Okay, um, my name is Jordan Matos. I'm based in New York City and I work in sales and distribution of international feature films for the US market. And I've also co-founded Cinemarket, which is a digital market for buyers and sellers of film rights <clears throat> based in Berlin. Okay, maybe now you, Alice. Uh, hello, I'm Alice. I live in Leeds in the north of England. Um, I program films for Leeds International Film Festival. Um, I also work to organize community film events in small spaces on a more DIY level. I'm also completing a PhD right now, writing about the history of local independent film exhibition. And I attended the Locarno Industry Academy in 2019, and I'm really happy to be part of this event today. Thank you. I uh, am Emmanuel Pizarra, I'm based in Paris, France. Uh, I am an international sales agent. I'm currently working for a company called Kinology, where I'm in charge of acquisitions and sales. And I was very happy to be a part of the Locarno Industry Academy five years ago in 2015. And very excited to be a part of this conversation. Hi, I'm Anaï Estudillo. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Nayar Lab. I signed up in our house in a small city of Mexico. I'm here now. Um, I'm an exhibitor, I'm a programmer in training, I'm a researcher, and for me it's very important to make a community and create atmosphere uh, to generate a critical and active audience. And I'm so happy to stay here. Thank you very much, guys. You should mention, Anaï, that your cinema is the only independent cinema in the state of Najarit, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I'd like to get uh, deeper in our topic, starting with a very uh, nice quote I, I found the other day, it's by Godard, and it goes like this. What consoles me is that somewhere in the world, at any hour, there is a sound, uncompromising in its monotony. When it stops in Tokyo, it starts again in New York, in Moscow, in Paris, in Caracas. And that, now, that noise is that of a film strip running through a projector. And it is our duty to make sure that, sound, that this sound never stops. So uh, this quote by Godard uh, was uh, written on the wall of a very famous cinema in Paris called Cinema La Clé, 
who was threatened uh, to close before the pandemic and which is uh, uh, obviously still closed today. Uh, we all know that those projectors doesn't work, uh, those projectors doesn't work alone, right? But today the, panora the panorama is, is, is like this. So shooting have been stopped everywhere. Theaters like La Clé have been closed worldwide and some might never reopen again. We, we, we all knew it here, right? And while Europe, for instance, seems to be slowly going back to normal in Latin America and in the US, for instance, as well, uh, the situation is still very critical. This is an unprecedented situation in the history of cinema and for our cinema industry. The pandemic has deeply affected our work, the way we do it and the way we envision it, but also it has accelerated the process of transformation already ongoing before the pandemic. Because it's true, in this cinema and in this cinema distribution channel, we're not already uh, in the best situation. So we're here to talk about work, uh, the specific work of each other, being part of this specific industry and industry of prototype. Uh, cinema is an, industry, is an industrial art, right? So we can ask ourselves how to, pick, how, how to keep making and watching film in a type of crisis. What kind of film and where? We are all doing a work of patience. We go deeply uh, deeper in this, um, in this aspect of our work, but it is not always uh, so easy to make a living out of it. So this session will be really a dialogue with uh, two guests who work in cinema and how two uh, ex participants who also work in cinema in a different way. Sarah and Julia, you're making films and our fellow Academy graduates are making them available for the world. May it be in a US megalopolis or a small town in Mexico contributing in their way uh, in the filmmaking. So this conversation will be split in uh, 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 four topics uh, and we will see we have enough time to, to, to explore uh, each of them. Uh, we will begin with your work, uh, Juliana. Uh, so in your film, you've been uh, filming people at work. So may it be nannies, uh, teacher, grave digger, housekeeper, supermarket manager and cashier, and you're not depicting a, a privileged classes uh, at work. So we'll go uh, uh, deeper in what you do and, and what, what, what is it filming work and, 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 and filmic work, filming workers and what it means. Then we will explore uh, more um, what is it to be working as a filmmaker today uh, and uh, the reality we have of course the pandemic but there is also a political turmoil uh, happening in brazil that changes the way you work today now we talk about uh, then we talk about uh, working together producers and director and i think our audience will be uh, tremendously interested in, in in understanding what's the dynamic uh, between a producer and a director and then if time allows us to we will talk about uh, the cinema industry as a, an ecosystem right we know it's industry of prototype a specific economy very different in each can in each country but it's also a unique and fragile ecosystem what's happening to this ecosystem and uh, finally is cinema a business like any other so uh, friends uh, we have one hour to explore all these topics I will uh, let Emmanuel maybe uh, introduce the first one and, and, and let's talk about uh, Juliana's work uh, to begin with. Yes, uh, thank you, Marion. So as Marion said, um, we wanted to start with uh, talking about your work and in a, in, in a very interesting way. Your work is a, a lot of time, very often about workers. As Marion said, your characters are often school teachers, supermarket managers, nurses, maids, uh, doctors, or even grave diggers. And, they often greatly defined and often suffocated also by these professional functions and by the workplace, which work as a sort of magnifying glass uh, for human relationships, power struggle, domination, sometimes sexual attraction. So maybe can you tell us a bit more about what it means for you to film work, to film workers and the workplace? Yeah, for me, uh, work was, and workers were always a, uh, a very important part of my life. Uh, when I was uh, a teenager, uh, my father lost uh, his job. He had a small company and they shut down and that affected him very 
uh, hardly because he had uh, trouble. He had financial trouble that we have to overcome. And he had trouble to uh, go back to the uh, uh, to the market because he was already in his fifties. So that uh, uh, struck me a lot how uh, our work could uh, or, or being without work could affect someone's uh, dignity. Could affect and, and it affect all, all the family because he was really uh, impacted uh, emotionally impacted by by that. Uh, so it was was always something that I paid attention. And when we you were in college in film school, uh, I studied with uh, Marco Dutra, who co-wrote co and direct uh, many of my films, and with Caetano Gotado, who works as a editor in my films. And when we were in the second year of, of film school, we had a big uh, strike in the University of Sao Paulo. And it was a very transforming period for me because uh, it was a strike uh, that unite uh, students and workers and teachers for better conditions of work and for better, better quality of uh, of the education. Uh, and we had a lot of classes uh, between different departments of the school. And at, at the same period, because we were on strike and we were without classes, uh, we looked for workshops to do in Sao Paulo. And we got closer to a theater company called Companhia do Latão, which is a very important uh, theater group uh, in Brazil. Uh, and that uh, uh, uses uh, its uh, references uh, at the theater by Brett, and they use uh, collaborative dramaturgy, where the actors and everyone in the group they collaborate with the creation of the play. So that was really transforming for me and I, we discuss a lot about work relations and social relations and how they affect life and how I feel like uh, the systems sometimes try to, to seem like work is not important in your life. You see a lot of films and you don't know, you don't see the person in their workplace. And in fact, in reality, it's a big part of our life. It's, really important because we give most of our time to our work and we suffer a lot of oppression uh, in, in work. So I, I always wanted to portray that. And also when I was in college, I worked in like a video store, a rental store. Uh, and uh, at first I thought it would be like a very cool job because I would see a lot of films and I would recommend films, but actually the company was very oppressive and we suffer a lot of oppressions there. Uh, like they controlling all the time if you are working, like the owner of the store would watch us through the security camera and if you were, if you were doing nothing because there were no customers they he would call the manager to say that we were not working uh, so i also realized a lot of uh, the complexity of our society and oppressions because i was a worker and in, in that job i created a lot of close friendships that uh, I, I have until today uh, and a lot of the things that I uh, realized in that time, in that I experienced as a worker, I put it in my first feature film, Hard Label. Uh, so the, you have a scene where you have the owner of the little supermarket and a former employee goes there to shop and she tells the, uh, the cashier to go after him because she's afraid that he will steal stuff. And uh, we, we went through that situation. There was a guy who was dismissed. When, when he came back, we had to watch him because the manager was afraid that he would steal the stuff. So that is very strong because it's a very indignity way to be treated. And so I, that's why I, I want to 
show that in all my films, even if it's not the main issue, for me it's very important that uh, these relations are portrayed because I think even fiction films, uh, they are like a register of the time that you are living. Uh, and uh, so I think it's impo important to, to have that because it's like a document of the, the period. And even in this pro project that I have in the films after tomorrow, Cidad Campo, it's uh, a film in two parts and uh, <clears throat> talks a lot about work relations. And I actually, I first, uh, the first version of the script I wrote like 10 years ago and I change it a lot, the story, because the work reality changed a lot in the last years, because there is what we call a precarization of workforce. Um, I don't know how to say in English, but it's like, it's more and more, less and less rights. The idea that you are your own boss and you don't are not hired and you have no security. And that is happening in Brazil very strongly. Uh, everyone, uh, even if you work for a company, you are not hired by a company. You are your own company, so you have no rights if you are sick or if you suffer an accident. So, and, and also the apps the, that you use for transportation and eating, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that uh, work there and they are very oppressed by the companies. Uh, so I changed the script to adapt to this new reality of work in Brazil. Um, I, I, I wanted also to, to, to stress on the fact that, yeah, the, the way you depict work is really like, uh, that's the, the basis of the existence of, of your character, but it's also the scenery where you, you um, element of horror or fantastic uh, comes in, right? There is work and there is a monster uh, in your film. Uh, on the other side, I think about, well, uh, hard labor, of course, and good manners, but also doppelganger, right? Uh, there is always a monster, something that uh, oppresses us even more for completely unrational reason. And, and, and it's really the opposite of the control you're supposed to have in your work. Working, uh, in your working life. How, do you want to explain a little bit about that? How you make that connection between depicting the, the work reality and the, the, the fantastic, the genre element in your cinema? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, yeah, the genre and the fantasy in my work is very present. I was always drawn to that kind of journey. Since I was a child, I would listen to tales that my parents told and my uncles. Uh, and in film school, I got uh, what uh, make Marco and I became close friends. It was the same attraction for the genre. And uh, what I think it's uh, amazing about fantasy uh, and horror and this kind of codes is because they help us to, to assimilate reality. It's a, it's a fi we need fiction to deal with things that are complex. And I think fantasy is very important. Since the beginning of uh, humankind, we have tales that try to explain why there is the day and the night and why people die and why people born. So it's part of our DNA as humans. And it's part of each culture has its, its own way to tell uh, uh, fantasy and folklore. So for me, it's uh, very natural to use genre to, to tell those stories. Uh, and I think it's important also because it sometimes can serve as a metaphor for something that it's not personified by a human being, like capitalism. It's not a person, so you can't make uh, people are complex. You can't make a person that is capitalism because they it, it will seem fake. Uh, but there is something, there is a system that op oppresses, there is a class system and a race system that still is, uh, oppresses for a long time or the invisible hand of the market. It's, it's a ghost that haunts us 
for a long time. So that's why I want, I like to use it uh, as a way to criticize that. And uh, uh, a lot of uh, horror films do that. They use genre as a political comment. And you can see that like in George Romero's film and also Jordan Peele's Get Out. So it's uh, always been used as a way to criticize and to, I think it touches more deeply when you use mm -hmm. those allegories. Is, are those elements in your uh, next film, Cidade Campo as well? And how did you adapt somehow a fantastic element or the monster uh, uh, to the new reality in Brazil uh, in, your, in your next film, right? Maybe you will change uh, more things, mm -hmm. I don't know, because you, mm -hmm. you, you couldn't shoot it, you will shoot it later, so how are you thinking about now with your next project? Yeah, yeah this project, uh, this project, uh, it has some elements of genre and fantasy, but I think in a more existential way. I don't see it as a horror film, but we deal with the ghost and the border with the life and death uh, because we have, it's a story that talks about migration and work relations, but also talk about personal relations between uh, uh, parents and children and about life and death. So, and it, it's personal because I came, I, I'm from the city, uh, but my, both of my parents are from uh, rural background. They are both from farmers family and the countryside has an important uh, role in my life because I used to go there a lot and I used to hear the tales and I have uh, a relationship with nature. So for me, it's very important uh, these two worlds. Uh, that uh, and how we try to balance them the urban world and the more ancient countryside work that uh, so I want to talk about that uh, I don't know yet how uh, the pandemic will affect the script we, I will certainly have you have to change it uh, first because of production matters because we have to shoot it when we will we'll be able to shoot it we will have to have a safety protocol and some some interactions will not be possible so i will have to either change the scenes or represent it in another way because you don't have you can have agglomeration you can have very close contact so we are still understanding those protocols so i can work on the script but also how uh, the virus uh, put in evidence some elements that were already on the script, like the huge uh, social difference that we have, especially in Brazil, and how the most vulnerable people, the most poor people are more affected. And the people who are everyday workers that can stay home because they, uh, they don't have the work safety to, to stay there and, and they ha they work in the basic service or they don't have a formal work relation that can uh, allow them to stay at home so that is really strong for me how and uh, I, I don't know yet how I am going to deal with that because I, I also don't know and it's hard to see it, it changed a lot because we are like four months already, over four months in, at home. And mm -hmm. at the beginning, it was really scary because it's like you're living a, a horror film about mm -hmm. a virus and you see a lot of people dying and you are really affected by that. Uh, and then you, you think about how the world is going to be after this ends. Not only how we uh, interact as humans, are we going to wear masks all the time? Are we going to hug? Uh, but also, the, are we going to deal with those social issues or no, everything is going to be the same and the same oppression. So, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think, oh, 
now things have to change and sometimes I am pessimist and I think, oh, it's the rich people will keep exploring and it will be the same. So that changes a lot. And also how we deal with this tragic scenario because in Brazil for a long time now, every day we have like more than 1000 people dying. So there is a point where you kind of, it becomes abstract because you can't, if you relate to it too strongly, it's, you get destroyed. So it's something that I'm still processing. And uh, uh, I don't know, because I don't know when it's going to end, because it feels like we are in this situation forever. Other countries have already gone out of this situation, and we are still in the same deadly plateau. Mm -hmm. And you see people acting like it, it has already passed. You know? So it's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know if, okay, maybe uh, we, we, we can directly uh, go to the, the, the second part, right? Because I think we are entering in more uh, political uh, uh, question. You were mentioning, well, the, the, the monster is nobody. Uh, we were talking about uh, how uh, the pandemic affects your work and, 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 and and but also there is a, a real monster uh, now uh, somehow in Brazil, right? Uh, the political situation is it's really complicated. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how is it to work in this context? And, and, and maybe Jordan, you want to, 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 to introduce this topic and, um, and we'll talk about it. Sure, sure. So this, the second topic is working in political turmoil and obviously the pandemic. And I think we wanted to learn from you <clears throat> and Sarah um, a little bit more about how your creative processes may be affected by working under duress of crisis. Um, for example, do the kinds of stories that you tell, or do they, are they any different? Do you feel more a sense of urgency on the kinds of stories that you write? Um, be, as a response to the crisis. And obviously your work has already been political from the very beginning, but um, do you feel this point in time is going to be affecting you creatively, both of you in the future in any way? Yeah, I think definitely we will affect us. It becomes, we, it's like an instinct of survival because cinema is at risk. We have, not only because of the pandemic, we are facing uh, difficulties that I had never faced, but also because of our political situation in Brazil and the lack of funding and how culture is be being treated and how artists are painted like enemies of democracy by fake news and, and there is, you know, there, there's a lot of people that think that artists, they, they have a metaphor that we suck in the, the teeth of the government, that we, you know, are only taking money to survive and that we don't work and we don't uh, make something that is profitable and important. And it's really sad because uh, culture is a very important part of a country, of a nation's identity. And it's important as because it's educational, because it's political, and it's also uh, it's also a business. It also employs a lot of people. Cinema employs a lot of people and it makes circulate a lot of money. Uh, so, and I when I start making movies, I was uh, very privileged because I lived a time of uh, a lot of uh, public investments on film. And uh, I can say that uh, my career, I have this career and this international career and I've been able to make those, those movies because of public funding. Not only the support for production, but also the support for distribution and to participate in festivals. And that's how I, I went to one film to another. 
so I live a very uh, a very prosper time, and now I am facing a very harsh reality that we don't uh, like my film is one of the films that were in the last uh, contest, public contest that won funding. And after it, it was like, I, I think over two years ago that we won this money to make the film. And then after that, there was like nothing for independent film. And it's very hard and people, other filmmakers are very, they feel very lost because we don't have a perspective for filmmaking in Brazil because of the lack of how, how our cinema is being treated. And I think it's very important to listen to Sarah because uh, different yeah. of me, Sarah lives many different realities of Brazilian cinema and she managed to get through and keep making important films. So it's, uh, I think we, she can say more about the, the scenario. Hey, Sarah. It's me? É. Não? Sim. Não, fala aí é. sobre a realidade do cinema que a gente está vivendo e a perspectiva com a carreira que você tem, que o Alma Corsária foi o primeiro filme que você produziu e que foi um dos poucos filmes na época. Você começou a produzir filmes numa época que não tinha fundo, né? E aí depois você viveu a época dos fundos, e agora a gente está vivendo essa época muito particular, né? Bom, hello, everybody. I'm Sara Silveira, the little producer from Brazil. My country is one chaotic country in this moment. With the pandemic, I'm very sad, but with our government, our authorities, our culture. I have 70 years old. I look like a young girl, but I'm not. And I have to fight with my age now, with this government, with this situation in Brazil. We have the example of Juliana in this moment because we cut the work when we was uh, in the beginning to shooting. And it was cancelled, cancelled, and uh, uh, we are thinking about what we can do in this new moment. Me, I live, uh, I live the, with the cinema, the end of Ember Film in the government in '92, uh, color uh, pre president color government. It was finished with our cinema, but with too much uh, fight, we, we, we took back our cinema uh, and we created one law for that. These last 20 years, we can say 20 years, it was the one oasis for cinema. It was the big moment for us. We arrived in the old international festival and we arrived also in the screen to, to show our films included in our country because our country distribution for national films is very hard also because we fight all time with the hegemony cinema like in American cinema. Now you have a very curious and complex situation. We are waiting to decide what's happened with us. Me, I don't know. I'm stopped with my office since 18 March. Today I'm here. When I came here, I'm very happy because I remember I was producer. And uh, we try to, to, re, uh, to uh, retake our work. I, I, I hope in August maybe we can, we can uh, back into the work and look for money. But our money in Brazil doesn't ex exist in this moment. For me, it's very hard. I'm very sad to see Juliana, who is one beautiful project now, the new one. And I, I, we, do, we don't know how I can do my film now because 
the the first protocols coming with uh, to us is like 40 percent more the budget to do the fuel we have to pay the medicine we had to pay the people works with uh, sick people. We had to pay the tax. We had to pay where responsibility. We have a responsibility if one people uh, take COVID. I have to pay all the transport for these people. We have, we don't, uh, we can't shoot in with more than 50 people in the set. It's very hard in this moment. We are waiting for the situation because my feeling it was because I have me, Sarah, particularly like a producer, I have many force. I want to do films. COVID, that, that, uh, COVID never stopped me to work. I try, I will try to work at time, but I'm afraid because our country is very, very dangerous now with this, uh, this sickness, this, this problem. Uh, this is the moment. The, we finished it has two years ago. It was stopped our money, all our money. We the film of Juliana is the last one of the last government because we with this new government is nothing because they hate uh, culture, they hate cinema, and uh, we are waiting for a solution from them. But we don't have it. We don't have it until now. We are in this moment in Brazil to 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 put all the producers together, and you are and you try all together, all producers and distributors, all people to go to the justice to find our cinema. But we don't know who will have to with us. But me, I have to cry. I have to fight. I have my money to, to, to finish it, to, to, to shoot the Juliana. We have almost the, almost the all, all total budget. We need some little money to finish. I, I, can, I can shoot it, I can uh, edit it, I can edit it, and you can continue. But we need to work the, the, to wait the authorizations. Because our country is in very bad situation with the pandemic, and I, I hope I hope we can think about shooting in November, December, January, February, not not uh, not before that. To work with Juliana is one pleasure. Is my like my daughter, Juliana, Marco Dutra, and Caetano Gotardo. They are my directors. I still, I still waiting for my dreams to do the to do to the, their films, and I can't speak too much. I can't I can't speak much more about cinema in this moment in our country. We use the 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 the, the calls in the international calls, in the festivals, in the work labs, everything like we put our film in the, the, in the films uh, after tomorrow, because we want little chance for us to get some money to, for our films. I have other films I have to shoot in, I have other films to shoot in, but we don't know what will happen with us. Me, only like a producer, like producer, I'm strong yet because I'm not sick with this malady, with this problem in the world, but I'm sad because my films, all, all, all my career, I have more than 30 years in my career, I have almost 50 feature films and I do only feature films I didn't see publicity, other things, only cinema. I miss cinema, my body is cinema. And I love to discover talents. And uh, like Juliana, Mark and Caetano, it was new talent, it has 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And I have a force to continue. But uh, I have my heart sad because I can't work. I mean, like the, the personage of Ju Juliana with work, 
the work is the more important thing in my life and I can do my work and it is it's too much said for me. But I'm a force, I'm here, I continue. I have to give uh, esperance, hope for the people. I have this, uh, this, 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 uh, this, this, I know, I have to be an example to show my, my colleagues in Brazil. We have some too much groups working. I'm uh, normally the leader because I fight, I have a force and I wanted to continue to do my films and I count with the international side because I, I had more than 25 years in the market. I know every people, I know all the, the sector, I know the distributors, I know the exhibitions, I, I, I know every people and I count. The cinema will be more strong than this, than this world like now, this sad work you are living in this moment, is that. Thank you, Sara. I and don't I... know if I speak what you want to hurt about me, but my sadness is very strong. I need to work. I need to do films. We hear you, Sara. Thank you very much. Um... Anai, you had a question, and then comes um, no, huh? Jordan and Alice, right? Okay. Well, Juliana, I need to say you, I'm fan of your work. And I really now I'm very curious about your new film, Sudaji Gampo. Uh, the last year, in the beginning of the last year, we had your movie, As Was Maneiras, on our cinema. And we were impressed by the connection we had with the public. Uh, people was very, were very happy to their curiosity, had them to spend two hours in a new cinema. So in that sense, I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask you. Now I know more about your work. I saw everything, I think. Um, for the creation of characters, were impacted Mm, me are more the woman that you bring to the screen. What, um, why is important to you to tell woman's story and what it inspired you? Um, but why do you think it's important to talk about black women in the cinema? And for both of you, Juliana like filmmaker and Sarah like producer, how do you choose the story that you are going to tell? when in reality there are many topics to talk and is there an activism or social responsibility behind your work? Social responsibility. Uh, yeah, all of my film, they have uh, female protagonists. Uh, for me, it's very important to to represent them on screen. And I think also, uh, yeah, because we, the women are like on the basis of the oppression system because we don't have equality in work and in politics. Uh, and uh, there is an intersection with race. Uh, uh, black people and indigenous people are in the the more oppressed by this chain. So I think it's important to uh, represent them uh, on, on film. Uh, and I think it also, you can tell a lot about a society when you show a female character because they, you can talk about, that there are oppressions that are cultural like the role of how we see motherhood, how we treat mothers, uh, how uh, women are treated on relationships uh, and in family relationships, and also in the workplace, uh, the, the space that women have in workplace and politics. So for me, it's uh, uh, very important to keep representing that and to research that. Uh, and in good manners for, for us, 
it's a film that uh, the it started from the idea of the tale of the werewolf and how it talks about duality. So it's a whole film that it's uh, structured in the idea of this duality. So we have two parts and two female characters of two different uh, social classes and races. Uh, and we also have uh, two different uh, representations of motherhood, the biological motherhood uh, and uh, uh, the, adopt the motherhood by adoption. So there were a lot of things that we were, wanted to discuss in the film uh, and, the, uh, and, and they all came from that idea of that tale and how uh, talks about duality in our life and how we have to balance that. So that was the main uh, uh, inspiration for the film. Uh, but there is a lot of, there is an important discussion and it's a discussion that is very strong now in Brazilian cinema, the idea of the, the representation of people and who creates those images because I am not, uh, uh, a black person. I have uh, indigenous ascendancy, but in my country I am seen as white, so I have the privilege of the white person. And with that film, we learn, we discuss a lot. Actually, after the film, we discuss a lot of that. Uh, we discuss that a lot with the actress Isabel, and she was very important in the film. To to show us that because it has issues of representation because Marco is also white uh, and, and we are the people that are creating uh, the image of the film. And when we show the film that we had a, a discussions also about this representation as some people uh, are bothered some people like the film very much, and some people are bothered as some, uh, especially in the relationship between the uh, uh, Anna, who is the boss, and Clara, who, who is the nanny, but it also does house service. And so the, uh, there is a romantic relationship, but there is also a work of a relationship that is oppressive and that uh, it's complicated. And like uh, my girlfriend who is uh, black, for instance, she doesn't see the relationship between Anna and Clara uh, as a romantic, she sees as a complicated relationship uh, because of that, because uh, uh, there is an also work relations at stake that are connected with uh, uh, racial issues that are really strong in our country that uh, make it uh, hard to relate that as a romantic relationship. And that those discussions are, um, for me, are very important as a creator because uh, with them, I realize uh, something that we talk a lot about that is not enough to have uh, uh, diversity only on the characters, but also who are making those images because we have a system, a racial system that it's oppressive in its structure. So if you see most of the filmmakers are white and uh, we don't have people from, uh, indigenous people or black people making enough movies and we have a lot of talent uh, people uh, a lot of uh, black black uh, writers and directors and artists in Brazil and all over the world but they don't get the opportunity to, to get to uh, to do a movie and to show it around so that is a very strong discussion right now in Brazil that uh, the we have uh, we have to fight uh, structural racism in how we make films and how we make those stories. Well, uh, me, I'm a one producer from one producer, one author or producer. We can say it's not interpretation. 
but uh, I do the films, outdoor films. And uh, Juliana and Marco, they, they, they have one work that I love too much. Why? Because uh, our country is one big country, diversity country. We have many, many, many social problems. And for me, like a producer, if I found, like I found it to Juliana and my directors, I can, they, are, they, they can represent me, represent me when they are telling, they are counting our, our, our history, his, uh, his uh, script. And Juliana has this, this kind of work with work and that I love too much. Why? Because in our country we have my cinema is one cinema with responsibility. We have to say things for the people. We have to show things for the people. We have to show our diversity in Brazil and you have many, many problems. We have one cult, one big cult with many, many people and the half of it is big number of peoples in Brazil the healthy people is poor. And we have to show, we have to, 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 to tell the history for our public to listen, to see our situation, to know our country. Cinema is cultural also. Cinema is like education also for me. And the films the, uh, that Juliana does represent me. I mean, I, 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 I feel like a producer, a good representative. It is my, is my discourse also, is my, my world is also for the world. If I have the privilege, the privilege, privilege to have a director speak about social things, about the problems of our country, because when we receive the, our money from the state, we have to show for this state the situation we are living in this country. This is, a, is my cinema. My cinema is fight. My cinema is to show and discover solution for one big country like us with many, many problems, with bad men who valued our, our, our country. It has not now, it has many, many years. We have one culture, we have to, to change this culture. And you have to, one culture when the solidarity, when the people can change, uh, can, be, uh, can be everything the same uh, social conditions. And with our films, the Juliana's films, we show just that. And this take me, give me honor. I mean, I really like the artist. Because I'm not artist, I'm a producer. I mean, I only do films. I only do. It's the only thing I do. I I, I know do in my life is cinema, is films, and this when uh, I take this uh, this, uh, this 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 uh, script with social problems. This for me is my Oscar. I love. I love because. I be fighting with my director, with my crew for one Brazil much better than we have more in this moment. In this moment, Brazil is not the Brazil you, you all people knew when we was five, six years ago. Now we are not example. Now we have like Brazilian, like woman, Brazil woman, Black and the white woman do have many problems. And when Juliana does this film is like he does, for me, is my fight, is my luta, is my resistance. Is that I mean feeling like an artist in the outer house because I sign like a producer. The film can show the diversity and the difficulties of my country. Yeah, I think that's a good way to introduce uh, uh, the third blog. So maybe, Alice, you, you want to go yes. ahead? Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we've 
spoken already about some of the issues and themes um, in your films, as well as the impact of politics and the pandemic. Um, so now I'd like to chat a bit more about what it's like working as a director, working as a producer, and what it's like working together. Um, Juliana, I know you get asked a lot about what it's like working as a co-director, but today we're interested in the collaboration between a director and a producer. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very close and important relationship. Um, I know you two have been working together for a long time now, so maybe you could start by telling us how your working partnership began and, and how you work together. Hey, Juju. Yeah. I love you, Juju. <laughs> I love to do the films with Juliana. You can, you can speak to Juliana more because I love you. I love your films. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first time I saw Sara, I think it was like uh, in a public masterclass with other people. Uh, and I was really impressed because she's really charismatic and she's done a lot of films. She has a lot of importance in independent film especially because she produced a, produced a lot of first pictures. She likes to work with first time directors. And I think that's very special of her. Uh, and uh, when uh, Marco and I got f public funding for our first uh, film outside film school, we had done a, a film called The White Sheet that was uh, a conclusion film uh, in school. But after that, we got funding to do a project called Un Ramo, a STEM. Uh, and we needed to associate with a production company to find someone to produce it. And at the time, I was working with uh, Daniel Shaya and Carol, Carolina Guidetti. And Daniel uh, was assistant director for Carlos Rechemba, who is uh, uh, the co-founder of the Zenove Song in Image. So he introduced us to Sara uh, and she read the script and she liked our previous film. So she, she decided to produce it. And uh, that was in 2007. So it was like over 13 years ago. And uh, we were really, we got along really well since the beginning. Uh, and uh, that, that first uh, short film, we produced it and then I applied to Cannes and it was selected for the Critics Week. Uh, and then when it was selected, Sarah told us, oh, we have to go to the festival with uh, a feature film project because I want to start selling it there. So Marco and I started discussing ideas and uh, we came up with the idea for hard labor uh, based on some, some observation uh, that I experienced in my neighborhood of a, a middle class woman uh, that was working in a grocery store. And we can see that it was her first time as a boss. And I found that situation very interesting. And I told Marco and we uh, came up with the story about how a change in work relations affect that family and all the workers that are connected to it. And then we went to Cannes and we were awarded with our short film. We won uh, the Kodak Discovery Award. And that was great because it brought a lot of att attention to, to the project. And then we financed this first, first film, Hard Label, who premiered at uh, Un Certain Regard at Cannes. And since then we, we produced uh, short films and feature films. She produced Good Manners, and she produced The Moving Creatures uh, that is directed by Caetano Gotardo and that I edited it and Marco did the music. Uh, and she produced Todos os Mortos, which was in Berlinale this year that is directed by Caetano and Marco and I edited it. Uh, and she's now producing Cidade de Campo. So we have a long time collaboration. And 19, it's a very small, family company. Uh, uh, Sara works with Maria Ionesco, who is the executive producer, and she works with her for a long time. They are partners. Uh, and uh, Elena Ionesco, who is Maria's daughter, now it's a production director. 
So we have a very close relationship uh, also with the other employees in Dizenove, Alessandra, who, uh, Alessandra who does the accountancy, and Vinicius, who, who works here too. So it's a very, we exchange a lot every day, like we, I mean, you should come here and talk when we talk about movies. And I really cherish uh, that close relationship with Sarah, where I can show her a script and she tells me in her own words what she thinks of the script. And uh, she, I think both in hard labor and in good manners, we have major changes because of Sarah's comments. And uh, I think um, it's something that uh, for you that are young is really important to I know that you are now all producers, but it's something that some, sometimes I feel young directors and young producers don't realize how important that is, that relationship is, and how it's important to find a production partner that you relate not only uh, the kind of cinema that you want to do, but also that uh, you are connected with the ethical values of work, because Sara, I appreciate that, the Sara is very ethical about her work relations and how she deals with the employees in the company and how we, we deal with conflict during filming. Uh, so, and she also respect a lot the, the directors as authors. Like she doesn't impose herself. It's always a dialogue to find the best for the film. And that is not something so usual. Sometimes uh, directors don't have most of the times, I think directors don't have the final cut of their film. And mm -hmm. Sarah has always gave me the final cut. And that is a, an act of trust that it's uh, really big. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it sounds like you've got a really uh, kind of healthy, kind of very successful working relationship and, you know, that you really see that in the in the films and you know the success of the films um so yeah thank you thank you for sharing so much um i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what your sort of daily work routine is like right now and if you've been able to continue any any parts of work at, at this moment uh, no we stopped in march we were in pre-production. We were supposed to shoot the film at uh, the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, so we were doing uh, cast selection and uh, scouting for locations and yeah. doing the first uh, uh, part of the work with art directors and cinematographers to about the concept of the, of the film. Uh, but when uh, uh, the pandemic hit, uh, we already had, we already knew how it was in Europe. So we knew that it was something that could last for a while. Uh, so we, we stopped because we don't know when, when it's going to be safe. And it's a big discussion because you can only be completely safe when you have a vaccine, but we don't know, we can take a long time. So we are studying now how, yeah. when it's going, when it's safe to work again. And it's a very complex because you have like the human aspect because you don't want anyone to get sick or to bring sickness to their family. So it's a big responsibility as a producer, and as a director. And also it's a big risk to start working again. And like, uh, if someone gets sick, we have to stop. Uh, so we don't know yet, but uh, I kept, I, I talked to Sarah every, every week. Uh, now I'm happy because it's the first time that I visit her. It's the first time that I yeah. am in you the use same today? House. You use today? To, to do a meeting because you have this meeting with, uh, with you, Locarno. And you, yeah. you use the same after our meeting. Me and Juliana will work and we will speak about the protocol yeah. because yeah. I need to look for more 30% 30, 30 of my budget to pay everything. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I've been in touch with the cinematographer and the art director. We are seeing films, we have a group and we discuss. Yeah, but I think uh, and, we and will and find your solution. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also I have a lot of friends that work on the set uh, as assistant directors and sound recorders. So we are yeah. always in touch because uh, there is a lot of discussion about the protocols and everyone is worried about that because we want to have safety to do our work, yeah. uh, but also we need, we, we are without any financial support from the government. Uh, so yeah. people are in a very complicated financial situation. Yes. Uh, so we, everyone is really anxious about that. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a little time left uh, to explore the last <laughs> <clears throat> topic. So uh, I'd like to thank you. It was really touching, uh, depicting the relationship between producer and director as a kind of a family relationship now, made of trust and uh, and good understanding. Uh, we all depend on each other, right? I mean, we he, here uh, you are a, a director and Sarah is a producer, and we have sales agent and programmer and distributor, and uh, and. Um, an exhibitor. So I let you, Anai, maybe uh, asking the last question about this uh, ecosystem or big family uh, the cinema and our cinema industry is or not. Yeah, well, in the last few weeks, uh, the social life of cinema has broken, has changed. Uh, it's through many virtual doors were open as now. But many indie cinemas in Latin America and in the world are resisting and many are about to disappear. I don't want to be pessimistic, but the world we are living in is terrible. But like Godard, for me and many people, what consoles us is the cinema because we love films and we love the world what we do. Yeah. I'm open I'm open to change, but I don't agree to spend all the day alone in a front of computer. For me, it's dangerous to think it's a new normal uh, is purity have a premiere on, on video on demand. We could continue because we could continue to reproduce the same inequality and even increase it. So I would like to ask you now that we are here like festival, filmmaker, producer, programmers, exhibitors, how can we generate a cyclical uh, ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem uh, with living out in the cinema. We can also generate industry and much more. In our community, our screens are the connection to the other stories. How can we work together to be a healthy ecosystem? And I think Locarno idea of calling 2020 as year zero is very opportune because in this moment exists the possibility to generate, to guarantee access and to the other audience but no loss to sense of community and for that we need the films of tomorrow. So what can we do? <laughs> it's a big question. A good question. Thank you. <laughs> Como faz para fazer? Fala você. Não, você não né? quer falar. É, Maybe Sarah. Né? Maybe Sarah. Oh, uh, for me now, uh, uh, it's difficult to think about our future, uh, but we need the the we need the ways like the films after tomorrow. We need to have uh, our this world sales to have more 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 facilities to touch these people. Because we, we don't know, we do films for big screening, okay? For cinema. I, I think the festival needs to find the solutions for us. Like to maybe to show our films with little people, but show in the room. And uh, after the show, to do the, 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 the world sales, after that uh, by internet. But I think we need to show our, our films because me, I don't do 
I don't know to do films for near screening, only for cinema. And this is changed now, but now I think internet and the VOD and the, the, the ways like that will be the solution for us. But I, I in this moment, I pray for God to give one solution to continue to show our films in big screen. This is important, but how we can do? We, 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 we don't see uh, only one festival does it. In Brazil, we have this big festival. They propose to show our films uh, with, by some ways, but the ways is very hard because you have to use or television or platforms. Platforms and the television can kill it of can kill our films. You are in the middle. In this moment, it's very difficult to decide. I go to the festival in like Kani did. We have to go. With, we have to participate with the festival like that. Okay, we, this is the solution we have now. But I I cry and I I pray I pray for God. We have the solution for our films because I, I don't like to do the film for streamers. I love the films for cinema. Cinema is education, is future. Cinema counts, uh, cinema tell all the, the history of, of our soul, of, of our countries, our history, social history we need to show in the world. I don't know the way, sorry, which is the better one. But I I be I be I be waiting for for solution with the festival because we need the festival we need all the sales just we need we need to touch these people and I think it will be internet and the the conhecimento technology you had in this last twenty five years ago is like that. Okay, that's uh, a lot. There is a lot to say still uh, uh, about it. Uh, we have to conclude because this conversation has uh, come to its end. Uh, what I keep is, yeah, uh, cinema as a as a political and, and educational gesture, and and uh, and let's hope for the for the theater to be uh, still um, to. To, to be there, <laughs> even if uh, even after the the, the, the pandemic, and uh, and we know that uh, uh, it's a part of the diversity we want to to implement, right? So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Juliana. Uh, we wish you the best of luck for the film after tomorrow. Crossing fingers. I'd like to thank you also, Emmanuel, yeah. Jordan, Anai, and Alice. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet you. Ciao.